I'm happy to be back in the land of um, academia. I've done a couple interviews with professors on various topics as a motorcycle goes whizzing by on various uh, professors who've done research on different areas related to Freemasonry, including the history of Masonic buildings. But today I am with Associate Professor Pamela Popolars. She is with the University of Illinois in Chicago. It's one of my, I love Chicago, by the way, one of my favorite cities. It's such a cool spot. Yeah. Um, you know, your research areas has to do with, and I'll ask you to expand on it, organizations and social networks and the connections between the two, how a organization will shape the community in which it's located and vice versa, or the, the systems in which it comes into contact with. You know, but more in general, tell us about your your research areas and kind of your your fields of interests as a associate professor. So um yeah, thanks. Uh thanks for inviting me on the on the podcast and to, to talk a little bit about my research. So um so I'm I'm a I'm a sociologist. Um I have been here at University of Illinois Chicago for 30 years now. And um I, yeah, when I, when I first went to graduate school, when I first became a sociologist, um, I became interested in studying organizations and networks. And so that has been the, uh, sort of a theme um, over the, the course of my research. Um, in the background also is, is studying inequalities um, by, by race and gender. Um, my early work, um, well, in, in the field of organizations, I've always been interested in voluntary organizations, the the kinds of organizations that um, some people work at them, but generally what they are is what people do when they're not at work, when they're not at home with their families, and when they're not directly in worship in a in a you know a congregation. Um, although church related organizations are a big part of voluntary association world. But so that was that was an interest of mine from early on from my my dissertation work with my my dissertation advisor, um, studying the structures of those organizations, the ways that people join them and leave them, and the kind of ecological um, uh, competition between them and the network connect the effects of network connections between people in these organizations. And that was that was a theme of my research for a long period of time. Um, that was generically on all kinds of fraternal, uh, I'm sorry, all kinds of voluntary associations. Um, and it was actually um, uh, exclusively survey research, quantitative regression models, et cetera. I spent the first half of my career teaching statistics to, to um, undergraduate and graduate sociology students. But um, in, the, in the last um, little while, I, moved away from doing that quantitative work um, and was really interested in, in starting to learn how to do historical work instead. Um, and that's part of what brought me to, um, I was actually at the same time I was starting to do the work on the fraternal orders, the historical work, I was also doing contemporary work on um, uh, voluntary associations and social networks among immigrants. Um, here in the suburbs of of Chicago, and so it was. I was balancing those two projects for a little while, but continued with the the research on the fraternal orders. And then, what was it about Freemasonry in uh, particular that piqued your your interest? Did the I mean, more in general too. I was, I was curious. Did the interest in Freemasonry predate? kind of your academic career or was it the opposite? Uh, did the, did you start learning more about Freemasonry or find it interesting after your academic um, career kind of really took off? Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, so I, I mean, fraternal orders are a, a subset of voluntary association. So it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of a, a natural progression. The, um, in some ways, 
the um, the large data set that I wrote my dissertation out of that I helped my dissertation advisor collect um, that we published a number of, of uh, papers from included memberships in fraternal orders. And I remember, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, getting the survey data and reading the responses, uh, some of the open-ended responses where there were the, you know, the names of the organizations and some of them I recognized as what I would now, you know, I now know are, are fraternal orders. Some of the names I recognized like Freemasonry um, and some of them I just, I did not, I had to look them up and I was kind of fascinated. Oh, this is like, this is a whole branch of, of voluntary associations. But once I started, I, I mean, it's, it is, it's a longstanding interest, honestly, in um, organizations that involve brotherhood. Um, and I, 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 you know, I think there are parallels between lots of different kinds of organizations through the long swath of history in the United States, in North America, and in um, Europe that are centered on brotherhood. And I'm, and in some ways they may be related from one another, right? So um, in fraternal orders, in um, current day terms, you think about brotherhood as being the center of existence, not only for fraternal orders, but for some other organizations that many people would find extraordinarily different, but gangs and uh, motorcycle clubs, you were just mentioning a motorcycle outside um, your, your uh, building, um, and going back in history through um, brotherhoods or order, knighthood orders um, and monasteries. And there are some ways in which structurally, at least, not perhaps in terms of all of the details, certainly, but structurally, there are some similarities in those brotherhoods and they're, they're kind of fascinating to me. There's there's also sort of a sideline in, in in interest in in I don't use this term in my in my research but um, uh, and I, I I don't imagine that uh, that Masons use the term secret society very much but uh, uh, that is a sort of covering order is sort of interesting I I was an undergraduate at Yale where there are a lot of secret societies I was not a member of any of them but they become like they were just fascinating to me, these organizations. And at the time that I was um, in college, uh, uh, they were, most of them were still, or many of the, the top ones were still all male. So they were, they were incredibly mysterious. Yeah, the secret society versus um, the, the, you know, my, my dad, um, was the first one I heard it from. I mean, my whole family, myself included, right? We're lousy with Masons, but um, the 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 expression he always used was, "It's it's not a secret society; it's a society with secrets." Um, the secret society aspect, the mysterious aspect. It. I don't know. I don't really know where that. I mean, you might have discovered it more in in your historical researches. I mean, I don't know exactly where it came from. Like at some point the membership decided that they wanted to play into some of that stuff. Cause I mean, if you, I've, I've been doing some research cause our, our building is celebrating its hundredth anniversary. And you know, if you go back and you look at um, newspaper articles from the, the twenties through the fifties and sixties, you know, you're regularly seeing in the Windsor star congratulatory notices about who became the worshipful master of which lodge or, um, you know, grand master visitations, or if there was a snowstorm, they would use the radio to announce that the lodge meeting was canceled. Yeah. Uh -huh. at, at some point though, I don't know, somebody for, for whatever reason, or people's whatever reason decided, I think that they wanted to really emphasize the secretive nature of it, which, it was an interesting decision made. I'm not sure how helpful that was for the craft. Um, there's obviously going to be, but it's an interesting, there's, there's definitely an interesting dichotomy there between what is the exoteric or public facing aspect of the craft and what is the esoteric or membership facing aspects of the craft that it's still an interesting challenge even to this day. <laughs> 
It, yeah, it, it, it seems, it, it, can I ask you, do you have a sense of when that, like, oh, no, no, let's not igno announce things? What, it, is that like mid 20th century or something? It feels like, and this is, you know, I'd have to do more research, just anecdotally based on the researches I've done, it feels like that happened in the 60s and 70s is when the shift from being a public facing organization to being um, uh, an esoteric organization really started to take hold. At least in my researches, you see a lot less announcements in the newspaper mm -hmm. at that time. That's that's interesting. Yeah, because I've had people react to my research saying, oh, my goodness, how can you even study that? It's secret. How, how can you know anything about it? And I say, well, I mean, I, I have to couch everything that I always say in, um, a, 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 about masonry to academics and, and people outside of academia. Like I studied 19th century and early 20th century Indiana, mostly. Um, and so, you know, whatever people know about masonry now, that's not what I'm studying, and I, I've I've learned a little bit about it, but I, I I'm I'm not. But um, but yeah, I, I that that is one of the things that I noticed is things in the newspaper and things were I, it was you know uh, uh, there's a line between what's secret and what is not secret, and it's but it is interesting that there was a a pull in at some point because I get the sense na anecdotally just now that there are many places where buildings are being opened. I've toured a lot of buildings um, and I've had people give, giving tours basically saying, we're doing this to like let the community see, to re basically reverse that secrecy. <coughs> Excuse me, as I unmute and cough. Yeah, there is a, there definitely is a renewed push. I mean, I've been a Mason since 20, um, 2007 and even in that time there's at least in my jurisdiction in Ontario there has really felt like over the last five years or so even 10 years a renewed push to be more public and, and forward facing um, I think for good reason I mean this is just Cameron speaking not representing any any Grand Lodge positions it, but it at least from a terms of, of strengthening of the craft, I certainly don't see the focusing on esoteric and, and secretiveness as being particularly helpful from a membership perspective or from a, a lodge growth perspective. I mean, you are seeing a lot of, and this is true for almost everywhere I've interviewed, a lot of Masonic buildings, a lot of lodges are far more comfortable with open houses and you know, uh, inviting the public in and having forward facing websites and, and all that type of stuff. So, which I personally think is, is the proper approach to take, but there are, I don't know, I don't know the, there's no official terms for these things, but there are the, the esoterics for lack of a better term who are, are far more focused on, on, or would suggest keeping things more private in there. It's an interesting, it's an interesting tension that I don't think will ever be completely resolved. I'm sure it wasn't resolved even in your researches in the 18, you know, your, your paper that I read looking at Freemasonry in the end in the 1840s, 1850s. And, you know, I'm sure even you saw that tension between how much of Freemasonry should be public facing versus how much should be kept secretive and, and member facing. It's, it's a tension that I think many organizations struggle with. And, there's no clear line as to what the right amount is. You're kind of figuring out as you go. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it's it's a, it's just such a contrast with other things that go lumped it, you know, in sensational books with chapters on different secret societies. There's always one on Freemasonry, right? But then they're lumped in with organizations that are secret because they're revolutionary or they're illegal or so. Where it's like secret, like nobody needs to know they exist. And Freemasonry, to my understanding, has never been that. No, no, yeah, no. It, there was, there was, like I said, there's always been that that tension. There's always been a, a combination of this goes. I mean, this goes back to the Constitution. This goes back to 1717, and and even before, you know, how how public facing are we versus how esoteric are we, and and where is that line? And it's it's just, I think, it's the nature of 
Freemasonry and that is a special thing about it that it has that that line and it's trying to figure it out as opposed to other organizations where it's either 100% secret or 100% public, right? We have an interesting mix. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you you talk about this in in the paper that you provided me and then some other stuff I've I've researched, right? But you've dealt with with the public side of Freemasonry, you know, in your paper, uh, Moral Dividends, Freemasonry and Finance Capitalism in Early 19th Century America, you were using public documents from the Grand Lodge of the state of Indiana, from lodges within the state of Indiana. Um, you know, the paper lists the, the list what you were using. What was it like getting these documents? Did you have contact with lodges or the Grand Lodge directly? Um, during your research, were you in communication with either the Grand Lodge or the different lodges in the state? What was just the actual process of the research of gathering these documents uh, like and how much communication was there between you and the Masonic uh, lodges or the Grand Lodge in, in Indiana? Um, well, the, the, the short answer is, is, is none, really. Um, I, it, the, the research project kind of um, unfolded over, uh, is still unfolding over, over many years. When I first started, I, I planned a project to, to study um, like half a dozen fraternal orders. And, um, and I was interested in one particular, uh, you know, centering my research in one particular city in Indiana. And I did reach out to um, the, the local lodge there and nothing came of that. Um, I also, uh, so the 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 research ended up not addressing a half a dozen fraternal orders, but the 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 book that I'm working on uses both um, Freemasonry and the Knights of Pythias, if I can mention the competition. Um, but uh, so i've 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 centered on both of those orders, uh, my research on both of those orders. And when I, I did reach out to the to the the Grand Lodge of the Knights of Pythias in Indiana, and so honestly to to, to answer the question about who having contact with fraternal orders, it was only with the the Grand Lodge of the Knights of Pythias, and that was a very short um, trip. A, a lovely man who was the Grand Secretary let me rummage around in some records and copy down the names of officers for one lodge for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, I honest the the Grand Lodge of Indiana, the Masonic Grand Lodge of Indiana, uh, has. Uh, 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 they at some point in my research, I discovered that they had a library and museum, but it was closed for many years. And um, it is now, I think it opened maybe just before the pandemic or in, since the pandemic. And I, I just haven't been down to Indianapolis to, to go. So um, when I first started, I wasn't, I didn't have materials from uh, Masonic materials from the Grand Lodge of Indiana what I had access to was what was in the state library and the state historical society. Um, and early on, I spent a lot of time down in Indiana. Luckily, I have a brother and sister-in-law who live there. That's part of the reason I became interested um, in the uh, in in the area. Um, but I I was I was beholden to like going physically to the library and reading the the sources. Subsequently, I found that the sources became available. Um, either they were in a library here. Um, and honestly, a lot of them I found these books are for sale on used book sites. Um, and so I was able to gather some of those just by by buying copies of the book. So for example, um, the 150 year her- uh, history of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, that's you know a purchase online. The um, smaller uh, things. This is a constitution from 1910 for the Grand Lodge. This was um, and a history of the Tipton Lodge in Logan, Logansport. And then others have been digitized. Other records have been digitized. I, I can't remember anecdotally though. I, I, 
um, the what I think I understand is the um, the demand for uh, sources to do genealogy has really pushed a lot of libraries that hold records to digitize them so that people can do ancestry research. Um, and that's that's been a boon to my research. But at some point, the, the main resource, one of the main resources for the, the, the paper um, that I shared with you um, that was published in Business History, the uh, one of the main sources for that was the compendium of, of proceedings from the Grand Lodge of Indiana from its inception in 1817 through 1845. And that book had been only in Indianapolis for a long time. I was reading it in dribs and drabs. And then I found a digitized copy and, you know, I can print it out here and put it in a loose leaf and, and put stickies on it and highlight it and, and whatnot, things you can't do in a library. Um, and that was a real great boon to the research. <clears throat> I wanted to um, talk about, you know, what what you discovered during your research, maybe what surprised you during your research. But I did want to talk more before we get into that. Kind of define some of the the terms. Or one in particular, because right, your the title of of your paper, um, Freemasonry and Finance Capitalism in Early Nineteenth Century America. What is and and reading through the paper, there's you know, the primary term used is finance capitalism, although sometimes that can be interchanged with capitalism or business practices. But what is finance capitalism and how does that differ from say capitalism or or does it or other forms of of finance um and and is the type of finance capitalism you're looking at unique to the time period you're studying in indiana or is you know would would it still be analogous today to say stock trading and things of that nature yeah, the, the 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 quick answer is yes. That's I I, I would say that's a. Gen I mean, there there are there are a, a a lot of scholars coming with all kinds of descriptors for capital, different stages of capitalism, different aspects of it. You know, neoliberal capitalism, racial capitalism, end stage capitalism. Um, I, I was in the time period that I'm studying, right? Um, in in that paper is sort of early and mid 19th century. Um, so it's the beginnings of the industrial revolution. Um, and the rest of my research concentrates later in the century in the early 20th century, um, really the, the the center of the industrial revolution in, in certainly in that part of the of the country. Um, and so yeah, what I, I mean, as I was reading the these records of the first uh, 30, 40, 50 years of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, I was astounded to find this uh, uh, practice, this, this, this set of events where the first um, Masonic building was built on the basis of issuing stock and promising a return on the stock. Um, and th that's that pattern is what I'm using the term of finance capitalism to to refer to that the pattern of um, essentially raising capital to build a private uh, enterprise, raising that capital on the basis of promising your investors a return on that investment. Um, and building an enterprise that then, at least partly in the case of, of, of these, these buildings, at least partly as a for-profit enterprise. Um, that, that, that pattern was fi fascinating to me because I know that it was the center of so much of economic development in the, in the U.S. in um, 
actually in in later years though right the 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 shift it's only right around the t- the turn of the 20th century that like manufacturing started to raise capital by is- by going public and issuing stock um there's a short period of time right around the um the turn of the 20th century where um the the basically the capital size of the stock market just bloomed in in a short number of years. So I knew that that was later on, and I know that we've got you know various versions of finance capitalism all the way through. Yeah, as you said, all the way through to today. But it was fascinating to find it in like uh, r- rural Indiana in the 1840s, uh, in a time when it wasn't you know an institutionalized practice. You know, it's it's interesting going back to the start of our interview. We're talking about that tension between um, which exists today and has existed since even predating 1717. The tension between what is the public aspect of Freemasonry, what is the the private aspect of Freemasonry, or the esoteric aspect versus the exoteric, and where do you draw that line? I mean. My experience in Freemasonry since joining is there is a great deal of tension between the um, finance and, for lack of a better term, business, not for profit. I mean, pick your pick your term, but the the finance and 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 the business of maintaining an organization, mm-hmm. however that be structured, whether it be structured as a not-for-profit, whether it be structured as, um, you know, you, you have many Masonic buildings that have both for-profit and not-for-profit aspects, um, you know, throughout the world. It, there, there's that versus the, again, the esoteric, moral improvement, socialization aspect of the craft. You know, there's a famous expression going around amongst I guess it's, it's it's a newer expression going around amongst Masonic circles, right? Which is no one joins to pay bills um, because, you know, in a, in a business meeting, a typical business meeting, much of the time will be spent on things like paying of bills, a budget, reading of minutes. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting and in, at least in my experience, there's, there's a great deal of tension between the, those brothers or those members that have an interest in just the nuts and bolts of maintaining a building, whether it be through, through uh, use of finance capitalism related um, practices or whatever it is, but just how do you pay for these things yeah. versus those who are, are interested in the, again, the moral improvement, social socialization brotherhood aspects of it you know i don't know in your research did you ever come across that tension um what what did you find in again we're talking about 1840 i know it's a little while ago but, but did you see those kind of tensions in your researches or get a sense of the average member how are they feeling about you know these practices were, were they thinking about them were they concerned about them i guess where was that line between the business again i use that term loosely but the business side of the craft and the esoteric moral side of the craft yeah it was um it's i mean it's interesting to think like as, as somebody who studies organizations this is how organizations work right there's a division of labor right that um and in in an organization like Freemasonry, where the, the idea is joining for self moral improvement, you know, every, uh, presumably everyone's on board with that, has been screened for that, has been vetted for that. So they're like, that's that's what they're doing. But then within the uh, within a lodge um, or within a grand lodge, there's a division of labor um, who who is you know tasked with doing more the the business kind of stuff and people rotate through or get you know get elected into those positions um uh so yeah i i think that's in some ways that's a that's a a tension that's true in probably any 
you know, thinking about organizations today, any nonprofit, any charitable organization today, where some people are all about the mission and some people are about like, we got to pay the electrical bill. Um, and, and I, yeah, I, I, I think there were some, some tensions on that, um, in the records, you could see some, some people, um, through the, like reading through years of proceedings, you could see some people whose names, wh what they were doing over time. You could see that like they they were the ones who were coming to be competent at the maintenance, the you know paying the bills or getting people to sit still for long enough for them to to decide to to pay the bills. Um, it was it was interesting to just like to get that little glimpse just at least through the proceedings of the development of that kind of expertise. Um, and I'm certain there were also others who were developing expertise in the more esoteric aspects. That's not my the the a that's not going to be in the proceedings and b that's not the focus of my research. Um, I'm not I'm interested. As it, so this is how I think about organizations as, as an org theorist in a super simple way is you can think about what organizations do, who belongs to them, and how they're structured. And I'm really interested in the latter thing mostly, not right. So the the the, the purpose itself, the, the 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 moral improvement, the teachings are are less the focus of my research. To what extent? Um, do you think the adoption of some of these finance capitalism um, approaches or kind of that sector, those practices, to what extent do you think that there is an inevitability to the adoption of those practices based on kind of the and you touch on this a little bit, you know, in, in your paper, just the, the efficiencies that they, they can bring when it comes to things like raising capital, building a building, maintaining, you know, maintaining an organization. Um, you, cause I'm, I'm curious and, and I don't know a lot on this, this topic, but if you look at countries that have a different um, economic model, well, in, in some cases, like in communist countries, in many cases, Freemasonry was outlawed. Um, but if you look at, for example, it's it's an interesting little exception to the rule. Um, and there's different theories as to why. But if you look at Cuba, for example, Freemasonry is actually flourishing in Cuba. Um, uh, and it started flourishing after Castro um, came into power. Um, and there's different theories as to to why that is. Um, but, you know, Cuba certainly was an exception in terms of um, Castro was more than willing to um, look the other way and, and had no demonstrated no concerns or, or no active interest in in in, in persecuting or or, or outlawing Freema Freemasonry in an active sense, as opposed to other other countries, um, other communist countries. But. You know, I don't know what their practices were like in Cuba in terms of the financing of their buildings and, and their lodges. Um, but I guess in, in Indiana, in other similar jurisdictions throughout the states, you know, to, to what extent do you think were, were the adoption of these practices just an inevitability of looking for the most efficient way to raise capital versus... Um, you know, uh, were there tensions? Were there people trying to look at other approaches to take for raising of capital, things like that? I guess, to what extent do you do you think the adoption of these practices was an inevitability versus what other options could have been explored? Yeah, so that's that's that that's an interesting question. I just just want to um, jump back for a moment to your I, I'm I'm really excited to hear what you said about about Cuba. Um, I did not know that. I, I I've had the the chance to present this research um, at uh, several times in, at European conferences and in conferences where there are schol scholars from across the globe. And it's always interesting to me the reaction. I've gotten some really 
uh, reactions full of consternation from folks who say, oh my God, how can you study that? I've been assured by scholars in France that there is no way I could do this. I don't know if this is true or not, but that there's no way I could study um, and that it would be you know, politically uh, very difficult to do this in many parts of Europe and I would imagine many parts of Latin America um, as well. So it's, it's, I always have to say 19th century, United States, Midwest. Um, but I, I, I mean, yeah, there there are areas of the world where where Freemasonry is um, illegal. It's it's rare. Um, but there are there are those places for and then that for a variety of reasons that that exists. You know, the South America. You know, but in many South America, it's growing in certain places. I mean, Brazil, um, from what I understand, has a growing Masonic order. Um, Cuba, like I uh, had said, you know, um, um, the Bulgaria, like the, it's it's interesting. Um, it is it is an interesting. Uh, I don't know what the the term is, you know, uh, pattern we're seeing develop amongst where Freemasonry is growing in numbers versus where it's not, and different debates as to why that is. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the urban legend, I don't know if this is true or not, let me uh, preface that by saying I don't know, but the urban legend I heard as to why Castro was so open to Freemasonry as compared to other communist countries was because I believe it was during the Bay of Pigs, Castro found refuge in a Masonic lodge. They hid him from, so I don't know if that's true or not, but whatever the cause is, um, Freemasonry in Cuba has been a, a success story for the craft. Um, and then this, again, this was during the time of Castro as well. I don't believe it was ever officially legal, but like I said, it was um, um, Castro showed that he was more than willing to turn, you know, look the other way and allow it to, to flourish. Um, there's a, a pretty common practice here in Canada where we have something in Canada, in Ontario, and, and I believe the other jurisdictions, where we have, um, I'm sure you've seen pictures, you know, we wear aprons and collars. When a lodge in Ontario turns 100, it gets new aprons that have gold trim um, to signify its age. And a common practice was to send the previous aprons and collars to send those to Cuba, to a lodge down there, because they had so many Masons uh, coming through that they didn't have enough regalia for them. So, um, but again, it's interesting, and, and I, I can't speak to this because I don't know the answer. Um, the, in, in, a, in a socialist country, what the, or communist, I'm not exactly sure, but in you know that economic model, what a lodge looks like in terms of its, its what principles it's adopting versus, you know, the adopting the finance capitalism type approach of Indiana and that type of thing. Yeah, they they probably they probably wouldn't. It, there's there's a, any any organization that lasts the hundreds of years that Freemasonry has and that has spread as far across the globe as it is, is going to be different things in different places, um, uh, especially since there isn't like a central. Uh, but but yeah, I, I want to uh, address your your main question about whether the adoption of these um, business practices were inevitable or not. And I think that's that that, that that's a that's a really good question. Um, my argument is not inevitable. They were that they were not inevitable, and that they were um, surprising. You. Um, you so one argument is something that I think you kind of touched on in your question is about efficiencies. Like, isn't this just the efficient way of doing things? Wasn't isn't this just like this would be um uh a lodge would take a a, a method that is like the best way of, of raising capital. And the the so my approach to organizations is not to ignore efficiency, but not to prime a 
uh, make it primal or, or uh, the, the primary um, explanatory factor. Um, this is comes out of institutional theory of organizations that really also says that not only is efficiency important to organizations, but legitimacy is really important. And legitimacy in a particular area at a particular point in time, there are legitimate practices that are completely taken for granted, like this is the way you do things. And there are less legitimate practices. And from that theoretical point of view, um, uh, um, it is not necessarily inevitable that you know the Grand Lodge in 1840 would have taken on this these business practices like issuing stock and the the plan for the Masonic um, Manual School that that never went through but is a super interesting case um, in the in the proceedings um, there the description of the plans for it these methods that we sort of see perhaps from today as like, how else would you raise capital? Of course you would do it this way. The, the, the method of issuing stock and you know, basically borrowing money um, from, from investors um, with a promise of return, this was not an institutionalized practice. This was not completely brand new, but it was not widespread at all. And so that's why it's interesting to me to see this organization using that method that method. I do actually, there's a there were other methods for raising capital. Um, and the so um this the Grand Lodge of Indiana at some point was trying to uh use these business practices to, or before they started using these business practices to raise capital for their um, to build the Grand Lodge building. Um, the neighboring state of Kentucky, uh, they raised money by um, having a lottery, it, which is, you know, is a system of raising money in nonprofits in lots of other places. And in Indiana, they outlawed the use of lotteries. Local lodges um, were prohibited from having a lottery to build capital. And then around that time, the Grand Lodge started investigating these finance capitalism uh, practices, these business practices. Um, and you started to see, so, you know, Tipton Lodge and Logansport used this methodology super early on. And then the Grand Lodge followed and there were other lodges around the state. So there were other directions that could have gone. But in Indiana, the 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 Grand Lodge decided that lotteries were not the way they wanted to go. Um, they wanted to issue stock and pay off investors, including, which was really interesting to me later on, they had to get investors who were non-Masons. Um, and um, this is at the same time that you can find in uh, manuals of, of um, uh, like moral training manuals for young men in that same period were kind of preaching about the evils of finance capitalism practices, right? So it was not yet established at what was the legitimate way to go. And so that's why I find it interesting that the Grand Lodge went this way, um, that they were, they were grabbing from the milieu that many of at least I would imagine the Grand Lodge officers were working in a world where this was becoming something to do, but it wasn't yet like, of course you would do it that way. Um, and, you know, you talk about in your paper, the, and, and I, a lot of people might find the, the first part obvious, the, the effect that um, adopting some of these practices, adopting finance capitalism practices had on the craft and on Freemasonry, especially at that time. Um, but then you also go on to talk about um, the, the way that Freemasonry then began to have an effect on the world of finance capitalism and, and how it became um, a mutual interchange of ideas or or ideals, I guess, or practices 
um, you know, which which a lot of people may not think about in the same way. Again, going back to the idea, a lot of people view Freemasonry as kind of a, a one way one way gate where things from the outside world can come into Freemasonry, but Freemasonry doesn't then affect the outside world, which is again a, a modern idea. It doesn't reflect um, historical precedents anyways, at least in my researches. But, you know, that that latter piece, the way in which Freemasonry and some of its ideals then began to affect uh, the world of finance capitalism. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how th- that the way that mutual interchange took place? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the... Um... Um, in the in the setting that I was just describing, where you have multiple possible ways of raising capital to do something like build a building, um, and where different, you know, over the border in Kentucky, lotteries are okay, but um, uh, but there's, you know, in Indiana, there's a little swirl around this idea of of issuing stock and getting investors, and um, and you can think about ways that other organizations raise um, raise capital, um, you know, just purely through donations or through one like angel investor, not investor, but you know, um, uh, a, a, an endowment from from one wealthy uh, you know uh, alum or or um, member or something like that. Um, I think honestly in that in that milieu where morally it wasn't clear what was the right way to raise capital the freemasons had the effect of being publicly the most moral people in their local communities and by using this methodology that institute that helped to institutionalize it to imprint it as like when we do it this is good this is actually a a, a reasonable way of doing things despite the fact that like i said these these um uh um moral manuals for young men were were uh which were somewhat religious um that that they were basically saying no this is evil bad wrong don't this is exactly the same as betting it's the same as gambling um to buy stock in a in a in an enterprise i think that by um by having lodges use this method it solved the moral problem at least for the the members of the local lodge and other other men like them. This this was like if, if the Masons are doing it, it must be okay. It, it, it must be. I think that mo- that 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 moral um, kind of leadership uh, ha- had an effect. You know, you discussed in your paper um, something that. Uh, it's been a while since I've touched on this, but I want to want to uh, touch on it more, and have some some more podcast episodes on on this topic. Right, the idea of social capital. Um, it, there was a book written, and this was written in 1999, if I recall correctly, uh, called "Bowling Alone," which talks about the decline in um, social capital through the decline in basically voluntary organizations. I'm sure you've read it, um, right? As part of your, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a pretty important part of, of your research. I have no doubt. Um, and, and we recently saw the, the, the wall street journal poll, which I wrote about talking about the decline in certain, uh, it was a focus on America. I think you could apply to Ken as well. You know, the decline of, certain characteristics like patriotism and community involvement um, versus an increasing uh, an increase in the importance of money for people like the I my suspicion is all these things are are connected but from a you know the, the importance of social capital for both an individual but 
a a community um and kind of the, the effects of its uh, declining i mean you talked about uh, in in the paper kind of the unequal ways social capital can be uh accrued for lack of a better term based on who is a member of what organizations and who can be and in 1840 certainly um there's going to be some inequality in the way those things are are divided up um but i guess uh, both if you look at the historical context of of you know what did social capital mean in 1840 indiana and and how could 1840 and up and and how could freemasonry provide that but also from a modern context i don't know if your research has looked at this at all but um do you think that uh, from a community perspective from individuals are 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 you seeing a decline in that social capital um and and how do you think that has is affecting um kind of the communities in which freemasonry is located um yeah i i uh i have serious problems with some of putnam's arguments i have to tell you that um the the there there's a certain like sky is falling uh uh and the, the, I, I i think i did see some of the headlines about the the wall street journal poll and uh it, it's there's an issue of how you're how you're measuring how you're thinking about social capital and the and the ways that um, you know, it did the does the methodology of measuring memberships in voluntary, you know, community voluntary organizations, does that really suffice nowadays? Um, but that's 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 sort of a different thing. Um I uh, I think at the at the time um this is one of the areas that I I, I think uh I would like to find some more evidence on sort of some some uh, individual level stories about the the uh, career trajectories or business trajectories of of some uh, some individual members. Uh, I I do think that like belonging to the organization, even. Uh, you know, certainly in the in the in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, when the the numbers of members in all the, these fraternal orders in the, the the U.S., I I would imagine there may be a parallel uptick in that time in um, in Canada as well. Uh, there were a lot of people joining because it was the thing to do, and it was somehow good for their careers and good for business. And I know that that's deeply frowned upon but it's been done many 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 times for for the record it's not frowned upon by me i have no problem with it <laughs> others others do that goes back to that tension that we've been discussing throughout it right the yeah. the idea that there's a, a right reason to join and a wrong reason to join and um th th that kind of it touches on this idea of what is freemasonry and what is the forward-facing aspect of it versus the esoteric aspect of it and it, but that's that's another one of those interesting tensions that exists within, and I think it's probably pretty unique to Freemasonry. I don't, I mean, I can't imagine the Rotary Club, for example, would be concerned if uh, somebody is joining. Oh, it's for, all about professional. Yeah, or Kiwanis, or like I don't, I'm the Elks. Like I'm not a. Uh, there's so many fraternal organizations that have came and went. I think Freemasonry is uniquely concerned with. Um, of somebody joining for business-related reasons or some type of some type of social networking effect, and again, I think that is something that popped up in the '60s and '70s. I don't see that in in at least my researches. You know, you were you were in the '20s and the '50s, the, the boom periods. You know, if the mayor joined your lodge you were quite happy that the mayor joined your lodge, whether he joined it purely for political purposes to get votes. I mean, that, that didn't seem particularly of concern. They were just happy that he was uh, there, right? And if his political rival joined the lodge, they were happy that, you know, the political rival joined the lodge too, right? It was, it, it, it 
whatever got the guy in there, it seems like so long as he was in there and was acting appropriately in a meeting um, and not going around sharing sharing secrets and stuff, like his reasons are his reasons. It, but again, the, the 60s and 70s seem to be this time when a lot of these ideas changed. And as the secretive aspect became more and more important, so too did some of these ideas about joining for the right reason versus the wrong reason. Yeah, I wonder if those are connected. I, yeah, because I, I feel like I see ebbs and flows in the worry about who is joining and for what reasons they're joining. Um, but it, yeah, in terms of social capital, you know, your example about, you know, the mayor joining during during a campaign or something. Um, and that's part that partly, you know, if you think about social capital as like something that 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 devolves to an individual good. Um, uh, which is one, certainly the Putnam way of looking at it, um, partly. But um, it adds to his social capital, but it also adds to the social capital of everybody else in the lodge, right? Can now say, well, I was with the mayor, you know, at the meeting last night. Um, and so, yeah, and it, I mean, I, I, I like to think about the, you know, the members um, in, you know, mid and late 19th century Indiana, where things, uh, you know, throughout most of that time, it, a lot of Indiana is pretty rural. I mean, these are small towns, you know, um, and, you know, the, 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 the people who belonged to a local lodge were, you know, what my stepfather would call the movers and shakers of town. Um, and by them being in the same room with one another, that was, that was helpful to all of them in many ways. Um, as you know, I I I, I understand uh, just getting to the edge of the lodge room door. I'm not going in, right? But I, I understand that what goes on in the lodge room is lodge business and Masonic. But people don't just part ways at the at the at the large step, right? They they socialize or they run into each other outside of the meeting or there's they're socializing before and after, and all of that adds to to, to everybody's social capital. I also like to think about the um, the the Grand Lodge reps. Um, so traveling from you know Logansport, Indiana, or you know Madison, or someplace you know far away from Indianapolis, traveling to Indianapolis for the Grand Lodge meeting and the boon that that would have for meeting other folks. And at the Grand Lodge meeting, there's there's also, you know, so you're meeting people from other small towns. This is a, a place to build business connections, to to hear about new business opportunities. So so the, the social capital aspect there, I think, is strong. Either during your research, either for your recent paper, Moral Dividends, or just in your researches in general, what are some of the things um, that has most surprised you about Freemasonry? <sighs> um, I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I think the the cases that I, that I wrote about in that paper, I mean, I started this project by just reading constitutions and reading proceed, proceedings. And what hit me there was this accumulation over time of bureaucracy, um, which then led to like looking for and finding these business practices as well. Um, but I just, it just seemed to me that it just became more and more bureaucratic and partly that's driven by size and that's back to the, the efficiency argument. But then I started looking a little bit more at the legitimacy of these practices, like not all of them were legitimate to begin with. There was a, there was a fight. I, um, I think what, one of the, the, the earliest things that surprised, this is going to not seem very interesting, but <laughs> one of the earliest things that surprised me was um, uh, and it may vary in different places, but paying the secretary. And there's, I think it was the second constitution of the Grand Lodge of Indiana, where they institute a program to pay the Grand Lodge secretary. And it's literally, uh, um, I think it's 
six and a quarter cents for every 10 words that he writes on the law business of the Grand Lodge. Um, and then there were, you know, fees for charters and, and for various kinds of documents. And they go along for a little while with this system. And then they do away with this per word pay, this piecework <laughs> pay, basically. And they go to a salary. And to me, it was like astronomical. It was like $200 a year salary in 1840 or something like that. I forget the, the, the first salaried position. And thereafter, it goes up and up and up and up across time. And I started to realize, oh, this is so it moves from a, you know, a, a piecework rate to a salaried job. And like any salaried job now, right, it's it's a it's an ever expanding bag you can keep stuffing tasks into. And the 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 secretary became like by the early 20th century, the, sec the Grand Lodge secretary has to negotiate with the railroads to get a discount for members to come to the Grand Lodge meeting. Um, and they are really the, the paying the bills that you were talking about before, right? Um, it's almost like uh, he becomes the producer of the Grand Lodge experience. Um, and, and that was, I, I know that for somebody who doesn't study bureaucracy, that's perhaps not like surprising or super interesting, but to me, that was really compelling. Um, there, there were, there were, of course, there were also like gossipy things that came up that were interesting um, and and occasionally frustrating. I have to say this actually more in the in the KFP. The early history of the KFP was full of people sticking their fingers in each other's eyes, or at least from what I can tell. Um, but resigning and coming back and stuff like that. But in the Grand Lodge of India, I mean, there was a Grand Master who had to like leave the state because he was in a duel and uh, was going to get arrested if he didn't leave the state. Um, and those kinds of things are sort of interesting in between reading the bureaucracy. We should go back to that, I think. We would make lodges more interesting if we had duels, you know, oh, make gosh. it uh, def definitely would make it more more exciting if nothing else. Um, yeah, you know, and as as I can't speak for for anybody else who might be listening or watch or, <clears throat> or watching this or any other Masons, but you know, as as myself, somebody who who loves Freemasonry, right? The I, I find the bureaucratic aspects of it um, sometimes incredibly frustrating, but also fascinating and. Um, kind of seeing how those bureaucratic elements develop and why they develop. And, you know, you touched on this earlier, right? There is no, a lot of, one of the biggest misconceptions I think about Freemasonry that people have is that there's a, a unifying, you know, governmental single entity that kind of runs things. Yeah. But there's not. Indiana develops its way, as does Kentucky, as does California, as is Texas, as does Ontario, as does Cuba. Um, I liked how you pointed out the strength of that model, right? That when by necessity, you know, Freemasonry in Cuba is going to evolve different practices than those of Indiana, than those of Ontario. And that's a strength because it allows it to adapt and kind of cover the whole world. Um, but I just, yeah, I... I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I'll say, you know, you, you mentioned like, people may find it not interesting. I find it very interesting because those practices and how they've developed, you know, they're still being felt for good and ill today in the way that the craft is run. And um, it's just a necessary component, I think, for Freemason, for Freemasons to look at how not only what the bureaucracy is, but how it developed, why it developed, and to always keep those things in mind because the, the bureaucracy is a major component of any organization that has, I mean, it, it, at the height, 10% of the adult male population in different parts of the world were Freemasons, you know? So there's going to be bureaucracy that comes with it, right? And I I just think it's fascinating. And I enjoyed your your paper very much. And yeah, I think it's a super fascinating area that Masons need to spend more time looking at.
and and yeah, hopefully you don't mind some scholars looking at it as well from outside of, of, of Freemasonry. Um, no, and, I think it's great. I think it's, I mean, well, first though, you know, those, the, as you pointed out, they're, they're publicly available documents. Um, so they're publicly available for a reason or they should be publicly available for a reason, right? We, and also, you know, it, it's, it's something worth studying. I mean, people, again, people have forgotten for whatever reason or, or because in some cases Freemasons have kind of wanted them to forget the central role that Freemasonry played in, in most communities up to the 1950s, whether it be the economics of the community or otherwise, you know, uh, Copperhead Road, that song, right, by, I can't think of, yeah, right, he talks about his dad bought his car at, at the Mason's Lodge, because for most small towns, the that's where you had police auctions at, at the Masonic Lodge, that's where you had vaccination clinics, that's where you had um, dances, graduations, you know, other fraternal orders may or business orders may exist, but they would meet at the Masonic Lodge because that might, was the only game in town. I mean, it's, it's, and so I just enjoyed a lot what you talked about too, about how Freemasonry was such an integral part of the life of a town that when in Indiana they adopted those finance capitalism practices, it lended credence to that particular form of economic, uh, that particular economic system, right? I just think it's, it, it's an important reminder of the, not just how communities shaped Freemasonry, but how Freemasonry shaped its communities. Yeah, yeah, it it it, it did. It had a, a, a an effect and and yeah, um, legitimated those methods. I I I I do think there's an argument that it legitimated those methods for for either for Freemasons or people who were like them. Um, and question about what how how broadly they did, but the um, uh, all of this like what you were just saying about the the um, vaccination clinics and and graduations and whatnot, it all goes back to the buildings, um, which is really and and I, I should I should say that it's actually buildings that may be interested in this from the very beginning. Driving around the state of Indiana with my you know br uh, brother and sister in law going to antique stores and and small racetracks uh, and uh, seeing the buildings in the center of every county seat and even some of the smaller towns. And I, you know, you could, I learned to recognize the iconography of the, you know, the Odd Fellows Lodge or the, what are these castles? Oh, those are the Knights of Pythias and they're the Redmen buildings and, and a Masonic Lodge. It was those buildings that really got me interested um, to begin with. Um, and I and I, I I see that your the building that that your your lodge is in is you said celebrating a hundred uh, centennial. That's really really interesting. Yeah, and and you know the buildings the 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 built heritage of Freemasonry is something that I've really been focusing a lot on with this podcast and preserving preserving that built heritage for you know the next hundred years. Um, because that is, I think, a major component of the craft. And really, for, for most people, Detroit is probably the quintessential example of this, right? For, for most people, the connection that they will have to Freemasonry is through its buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, a typical thing you'll hear in Detroit and Windsor is we're going to the Masonic and that's referencing the Detroit Masonic Temple for a concert for, you know, because it's a it's a one of the greatest concert venues in the world. But they'll say we're going to the Masonic without any idea that they're referencing a fraternity. To them, the Masonic is just the name of a concert hall. Um, yeah. Right. The fact that it's a functioning Masonic temple with a, a concert venue. So the building side of it and, and that, as you discuss in your paper, right, in this the the financing of buildings is kind of what I think, as you discussed, pushed Freemasonry in, in Indiana towards finance capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. It was the the we're not you know we're not meeting in on top of bars and pubs anymore. We're we're building a stable kind of long term 
um, community center, basically. So we need to look at how we're going to finance that. Um, so so much of what Freemasonry is relates to the buildings and how they were built and how they were managed. Yeah, I, 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 I think of the, the time period that I'm studying um, as being, you know, like a, a great surge in buildings from, you know, like the end of the Civil War in the U.S. here through the early, uh, maybe even through about, well, up until the stock market crash. Um, it, it sounds, and it sounds as though your building probably falls in that, in that time period. Um, and many of the buildings that I've driven by and seen and, you know, friends know to send me photos of, of uh, lodges that they find in various parts of the world, um, or in, certainly across the United States. I think that that during that period, those buildings were a great um, uh, like focus of strength for the for the the lodges and for the order in it in itself. It's you know not to be crass about it, but it's publicity. <laughs> um, and the the buildings in Indiana, they're you know they're in the in the on the county seats. They're right on the courthouse square. They're right across from the courthouse. Um, so I think they were like a tremendous advantage because some of them also ended up being these profitable businesses um, or profitable places to to rent out space and whatnot. Um, and it's interesting to me now, I don't study this now, but I'm kind of anecdotally interested in the disposition of those buildings now. And there's so many of them that are no longer lodges. And that's another fun thing, driving through small towns and seeing what they are now. Um, and they've oftentimes been taken over for purposes that are really far away and by groups of people who are really far away. There's a... Uh, I can't remember, it might have been an Odd Fellows building in Bisbee, Arizona, that's an African restaurant now. And, uh, you know, a kind of a hippie bicycle shop in the Odd Fellows Lodge in, in, uh, in, in Logansport, Indiana. Um, and uh, lots of times, they, you know, they may be um, dojos for Taekwondo or self-defense classes or their yoga studios or something because of the space and the beautiful floor and whatnot. Um, but for the lodges that have held on, it can real to their building, it can really be tough because they need upkeep and their the taxes and um it's it's really difficult to to maintain them. Oh yeah, that's a huge, huge challenge. It, yeah, it, it has a lot to do with just the time periods we're talking about. Most grand Masonic buildings date to the 1920s with another kind of wave coming in the 50s, but Pre previous to the, as, as, you know, the, the time period you gave post Civil War to the 1920s is pretty much the time that a lot of these great, quote unquote, great Masonic buildings were being built. There are some that predated, obviously, but before that, a lot of Masonic lodges rented out space above taverns and bars and things like that. Especially when when Freemasonry first came to America. Um, but no, it's and and it's interesting you bring up. Masonic temples becoming new spaces or reused as different spaces. I mean, the classic example I always provide is Jimmy Kimmel Live is filmed in a Masonic temple um, in California, Los Angeles, right? There was a uh, Fleetwood Mac recorded Dreams, one of the greatest albums of all time in a Masonic temple that was converted into a record studio. California is like, fa I don't know, famous is the right word, but Cal California has so many Masonic buildings that have been repurposed. Um, yeah. For, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, to do with heritage rules and um, kind of the big explosion of Freemasonry in the, which I want to do a podcast on, but there was a big explosion of Freemasonry in the Hollywood studio system back in the 20s. Um, which I really want to do a oh, podcast on because okay. it was um, again, that, that was one of those times when people weren't as judgmental about the reasons for joining. So you had a lot of people joining because the studio boss might've been a Freemason or whatever it was. And so, yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a super interesting time period, but that's a whole separate can of tuna, but it is interesting. And I always find it fascinating when I find a Masonic building, um, 
my my hope is always that it stays with the fraternity. But if it does get sold, my hope is that whoever purchases it doesn't just tear it down, but uses it and creates new memories there and hopefully does something to maintain some of the, you know, original Masonic elements. If Chicago has the um, Nederlander, I believe it's called Nederlander Theater, which was a Masonic oh. um I did not know that. Actually, I, yeah. I've been in there. It's and it's uh, that that uh, the, the 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 lobby is just florid. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that uh, that again. I mean, certainly the 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 which is the hotel that's that was the Shrine um, Athletic Club. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, the Intercontinental Hotel on on Michigan Avenue. But I'm also forgetting, like <laughs> uh, right here in my neighborhood, um, on the north side of Chicago there was a building uh, that had been a Masonic lodge and then it changed over. It was a Buddhist temple for a long time and it's been torn down now. And there's a, you know, they, they erected a small private school on the place. And around the block, there was another place that had been a Masonic lodge. I don't know yet whether they were connected, but um, was the American Indian center for a long time. And now it's condominiums. Yeah. Yeah, if you're at the, I think I got the name right, Nederlander Theater. Um, yeah, yeah, they they changed. It was the Oriental Theater, but it's been okay. Changed. Yeah, if you look um, on the facade of it, uh, like three floors up, you can see the square and compass is still on the the facade. Oh, thanks. So, I'm gonna look at that. So yeah, it's um, well, it's been great talking to you, especially talking to somebody. I love Chicago. I visited there all the time, and I usually I'm, I'm in Northern Chicago, up in Glenview. I've got some Masonic buddies up there, but uh yeah it's like i said it's it's i always like it and and i think it's wonderful when academia takes a look at freemasonry and and researches it because there's a lot of insights that people from the academic world will have on the craft um and vice versa so you know thank you for doing your research thank you for sending me your paper and yeah thank you for taking the time to be on this square and compass podcast Thanks a lot, Cameron. It was really um, a great opportunity to talk a little bit about my research on, and, uh, uh, and, and you've given me some, some interesting new things to think about. So thank you so much for this.